Aloha, everyone. And uh, this last bit of the online institute is intended to give you a little bit more orientation. Uh, we sent out a survey last week, and we got your input. So this little bit is uh, connected to the input we got from you. So the plan for today is to talk a little bit about how to finalize your project blueprint, then the way you're going to get feedback on it, and then uh, looking ahead to the Summer Institute and what's coming up uh, in terms of PBLL um, and, and um, the NFLRC. All right. So uh, one thing that uh, I would like to uh, remind everyone is that you were supposed to create a document, which was a copy of the project blueprint. And if you did that, uh, you should have ended up with a link. So what I'm showing you on the screen is uh, the way that the document should be set up or shared. Uh, anyone with the link should be able to view the document, and that's going to make uh, more sense when I talk about the batch, why you want to have it that way. Um, so once you have that link, uh, some of you actually have followed the instructions, have, have put that link in the volunteer spot uh, place where we are sharing uh, all the documents. Um, if, if you haven't done that yet, I would encourage you to do that because the idea was to have you work with a small group of folks who can give you feedback on your project. So once you have that link, uh, the um, uh, interface where you come to see the modules uh, has a little button up there on the top that says Submit Project. That button is going to become active next week. So all you have to do is just copy the link that I just showed you, and you're going to use that to submit your project. So in terms of the feedback we got, uh, one of the things that I wanted to clarify was um, uh, somebody asked about the project idea and what we expect in that section. So one of the things that we would like you to do is to uh, maybe address these five questions, um, why the project is important, what the learners will be doing, and the last three questions are going to be a little bit harder because ideally you would like to have a student input in this, and we know that you're not implementing the project. So um, in an ideal project environment, it would be great, but in this case, it's okay if it's a little bit more teacher-centered and you make the decision. Uh, this is just for us to have an idea of what you're looking at in terms of the end products and how those products are going to be presented. And it can be just an idea. It doesn't need to be something that is um, going to be implemented. So the first two questions um, are related to the driving question. That's something that Liliana just talked about a little bit more. And uh, there's this uh, excellent tool uh, in the Back Institute for Education website that, uh, by the way, everything that I'm talking about is going to be shared in the lesson. So don't worry about, um, you know, uh, whether you're going to have access to these materials, because you will. All these are going to be linked there. So this Tubrick tool is a really neat way to think about creating uh, a, a good uh, driving question. And uh, as you can see there, you have you know a couple of framing words, the person or entity that is going to be doing the action, then the action or the challenge, and then the audience or the purpose. So uh, one example of this could be, how can we design, and then well, we can think of, you know, for example, homes. Uh, how can we design homes? It's a little bit too broad, but you can think of energy-efficient homes or smart homes or family-friendly homes, and then add a location to make it a little bit more specific. Still, how can we design an energy-efficient home in Jakarta? Still, I think, qualifies for a driving question because it would be kind of hard to Google it. And if you, even if you Google it, I don't think that you're going to hit, uh, you know, the type of responses that you would actually like to have. And as Lina said, non googability is mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of the question. So you want to make sure that it's not something that students can say yes or no, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, it's, uh, can we design a home, or something that is going to be uh, so easy to figure out that a Google answer will suffice. Mm -hmm. So if you unpack this question a little bit, this gives you or opens up a ton of opportunities, especially in terms of looking at culture, something that we have talked about in this institute. Uh, for example, in all cultures, we have different ways of constructing spaces for living. And those spaces can be, you know, some of them are considered essential. Some of them are considered non-essential. 
uh, there could be spaces that should be uh, bigger than others for certain reasons that we don't know or that we have to figure out. And then things associated that go deeper into the ideal culture, such as how those spaces are related to notions of, for example, privacy. So there's also other things like appliances and furniture and things like that that could be uh, an excellent grounds, you know, for discussion, especially if you think of a project like this in terms of a te telecollaborative exchange. Um, if you if you think about uh, things like this, for example, I always think of, of, of an example that uh, even an appliance can be the same. You know, we have fridges in Argentina, we have fridges in the U.S., but the way those appliances are constructed in the culture are very different. In Argentina, it's a big no-no to open the fridge if you're not a friend of the family or somebody who is close to the family. And in the U.S., you know, if you're a guest at a house, you can just go and open the fridge and it's not rude. So things like that really... Uh, it's, it's the role of the teacher to actually uh, gear, you know, the exchange and what is going on in the project so that those questions pop up and that those questions, you know, are addressed as you go. So I think that once you uh, have a driving question, it's going to be a lot easier to think about the importance of the project in terms of how the project is going to be significant in your context and what the learners will be doing. In terms of the product, we don't expect much. We just expect a very brief description and something about how the product could be presented. If we go back to this idea of constructing a home, um, if, if, for example, this, I chose these pictures because they kind of represent a wide range of levels in terms of language proficiency, for example. The first graphic up here it's a little bit, uh, um, you know, sketchy in terms of there's rooms and there is names of rooms and things like that. And it could be a perfect final product that can be shared, again, if we think of a tele telecollaboration. Uh, if you have access to a 3D printer in your school or in the university, this can be a very interesting project um, because the students would actually be able to see the 3D printing uh, results. And that, that would be, I think, would really be amazing to do something like that. Now, the one to the right is a little bit more complex, and it has things about energy efficiency, and probably the students are going to be, uh, you know, uh, inquiring about uh, environmental things and gadgets that help make a house, make it more efficient. So the language there, even if you are a native speaker, make it a little bit tricky, but this is part of the deal in project-based learning. You are uh, there to learn with your students in a way, and you are a language coach. So what you're trying to do is to, you know, try to keep all those questions about culture and why the project has been done alive throughout the project. Uh, and the last one is basically a model that is created. And if you can think of a project where the students create a model and then you film the model somehow or you create, you know, a Google Hangout and you share that model with the other group and exchanges of that sort. So in terms of products, we our expectations, let's say, are rather low, so don't worry about that. In terms of the audience, um, we just want you to be aware that there are a lot of ways to connect classrooms now throughout the world. So one of them, if you think about, for example, the Sister Cities project, um, there is a Sister Cities website, the one I'm showing you here, and there's going to be a link in the uh, lesson. Uh, for example, allows you to find whether your your city in the U.S. has a sister city anywhere in the world. And if you don't have one, uh, wouldn't it be a wonderful project to initiate something like that um, and use a foreign language, you know, to actually facilitate that in some ways. So um, things like this uh, are excellent resources. Uh, there is also, if you're thinking more K through 6, uh, then probably you don't want students to be exposed to this huge project sort of thing and you want something more controlled. So there are websites that allow you to connect your classroom with another classroom like globalschoolnet.org, uh, and there's also ePals, which I'm sure how many of you are aware is exists, right? So these are just resources out there. just wanted to uh, bring this up so that uh, you know that those things exist. Um, in terms of the project overview, we had a couple of questions, some very interesting uh, discussion. Um, one of them was um, someone asked why we consider culture as part of the language. And um, you, I think that you can get into all sorts of philosophical discussions here. But in a way, what we wanted to do was to uh, bundle language with culture so that you think about the content not only in terms of culture and other things. For example, in the, in the home example, 
construction of living spaces is the topic, and that's what the students are going to be learning about. Uh, of course, they're going to learn a ton about the culture, but the content itself, the vocabulary, vocabulary that is going to come out of the project is going to be linked to that other content, not the culture only. So I hope that this explains a little bit what the rationale behind this is. And of course, you know, be aware that there is no clear uh, boundaries between these two. Um, there is no, um, um, you know, there, there's nothing that prevents you from using the cultural concept as the main theme of the project, in which case the content would be the culture. Uh, but that's not the only option. So that's what we wanted to highlight uh, with this chart. There is more information about this in Lesson 6, so if you want to take a look at that, uh, that will be a good place to uh, clarify the two types of projects, the ones that focus on culture and the ones that don't. Now, uh, in terms of the rest of the um, a blueprint, um, there is uh, these other sections, uh, six sections, content, um, as already described there. Many of these have guiding questions for you to um, think about what you could put in this section. The guiding questions that you have there in the blueprint are not for you to answer one by one, but rather to give you an idea of what kind of content we expect in that section. And in some cases, you're not going to be able to answer all the questions, or there could be questions there that are not relevant to your case. So in that case, you just you know, feel free to ignore those. Um, in the language section, one thing that we would like you to think about is standards. And that doesn't mean just the actual standards, but any standards that would be appropriate in your context. Um, there could be district standards, or you know, there could be um, your university or institution may have some, or uh, that, that's uh, entirely up to your context. Um, and the, in the language part, what we really would like you to address is opportunities to learn outside the classroom and what you anticipate that kind of language exchange uh, would, would bring about in the project. Uh, in terms of technology, um, some projects are going to have technology or are going to be more technology-centered than others. Um, if, if you're thinking about a language exchange with for sure you're gonna have some sort of technology involved. Um, but what we expect here is a very brief description, maybe mention the tools and how uh, you expect the tools to be used and that will be uh, okay for the blueprint. In terms of the project implementation, there is um, a request there for you to give us at least the description of at least two tasks. And uh, we're gonna see in a second that those tasks need to be articulated. So by that we mean uh, we want two tasks that are going to be uh, consecutive in the sequence of tasks from the project. Um, so you can pick the tasks from any section of the project. It could be from the beginning of the project, like Liliana said, for example, the entry event it could be a task, a uh, frame as a task, um, and then what, what, whatever happens right after that, or it could be towards the end of the project. So it's your choice. Uh, we just request that those two tasks are linked, uh, that they are articulated somehow. So one leads to the other. Uh, in terms of project evaluation, um, you know, the, I think that the, the uh, questions there are uh, self-explanatory, but um, in, in any case, just to reiterate, uh, we want opportunities there to, or you to think about opportunities in your project to assess the content, the language, the 21st century skills. Um, and it, it's not just how you're going to assess them, but uh, how you think the project is going to open up opportunities for that kind of assessment. And then finally, the rubric. Uh, uh, the uh, rubric uh, section, what we really mean there is we expect the rubrics for the tasks that you describe in the implementation section. So it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, the whole battery of rubrics that may, you know, make up uh, part of the project, but rather... Uh, only the ones that are, um, uh, you know, related to the tasks that you're describing in the project. So, as Liliana mentioned, there is a rubric for rubrics. Uh, in, in this case, we would like you to be, uh, this is going to be available in the lesson again. And what you want to focus on in this uh, rubric for rubrics is the design part, the first three rows. So, those first three rows are basically uh, the ones that you should take a look at to see, uh, you know, if the, if the rubric, you think the rubric is, uh, uh, let's say, up to snuff in this uh, context. And then finally, uh, we have a note about instructional materials. 
uh, the idea here is just to list some of the handouts and worksheets that you might be using in the project uh, very, very briefly. And if there are any materials that you have that you can repurpose, and this is absolutely fine if, if you have something already that you think, oh, I'm going to be able to use this with some adaptation, it's absolutely fine to include those. But we don't expect anything else other than just a list of the handouts or worksheets uh, that you think will be included. All right. So in terms of feedback, um, you have a couple of uh, options here. Um, and this is linked to the batch. I'm going to talk about the batch in a second. Uh, but uh, basically, to comply with the batch requirements, you either need to give feedback uh, in, for your project or participate in the exchange. So many of you have already participated in the um, exchanges that we have in every lesson, and that would be uh, enough to um, fulfill that requirement. Uh, however, if you didn't have the chance, uh, or you know, especially for the folks that are coming in that are doing the self-paced uh, version, uh, maybe a, a more interactive way to do the um, this, this part would be to ask somebody to give you feedback. So um, in terms of uh, feedback and the, uh, what we did at the end of the uh, blueprint was to adapt the uh, Critical Friends protocol to an online version. Of course, it's not uh, the same, but basically the idea is that uh, whoever wants the feedback is going to request the feedback based on some criteria. And those criteria are the ones in the project design rubric here. So basically when we say identify one or two specific aspects of your project for which you would like to receive feedback, what we mean is identify one of the rows here in this rubric and then ask the person you're working with to give you feedback on that aspect. One or two would be okay, one is plenty. So if, if that should be enough for your uh, batch requirement. Um, so, and at the end of the blueprint, there is a little section there that is uh, meant as a reflective piece. Uh, we would love to hear this. We would love to read this part. And uh, so, if, if you can take a, a few moments to, you know, tell us what your journey through this project-based learning um, path has been, it would be great. Um, this is not required for the batch, but again, you know, it would be great uh, to have this um, coming from you. Now, looking ahead, uh, we're going to talk about the batch a little bit more. As you know, there is uh, a, a summer institute schedule on, and at the end of July here in Honolulu, and one of the requirements is a batch, which uh, you obtain by completing this online institute. Um, so the um, batch itself, uh, what's going to happen is all those of you who finish uh, with all the requirements are going to receive an image like the one that you see here on the left, and that image is going to have information embedded in it. So it's not just any type of image. Hold on tight to it because it's actually your credentials that you actually did this uh, online institute. So that credential that you get is going to be linked to three things, and the, the information, the linking information, is within the image itself. Uh, there's going to be a description page, which you already know uh, is the, the one that I just showed you. This is the description page of the, um, I'm sorry, of the online institute, not the summer institute, um, but it's a description page similar to that one. There is a criteria page that uh, is also linked to this, and it's basically telling people what you did to obtain the badge. And finally, there is an evidence page. Now, that evidence page is basically your blueprint. So that's why I was telling you that it was important to make sure that the Blueprint link is uh, viewable to anyone with the link, because that link is going to be what your evidence uh, is going to be. So that link is going to be actually included in the badge, and when people see your badge, they're going to be able to go to the evidence, which is the Blueprint that you created. I hope this makes sense. I know that it's a lot to uh, do in a minute, but uh, you can always uh, remember that this is going to be uploaded. You can always go back and watch the video and see how this uh, is explained again. So um, this is uh, the page that has the criteria for the badge. And as you can see here, um, the, if you take a look at point number five, uh, participated in a collegial discussion of topics. 
that can be either your discussion, your contribution to the discussion in any of the lessons, or getting feedback. So if you didn't get a chance to participate or you you thought that you were not interested in participating in the discussion, getting feedback from someone uh, and in the group will be enough to uh, fulfill this fifth requirement. Uh, once you get that image, once you finish and you get the badge, um, we're going to send you instructions. And basically, this is what, uh, what's going to happen. So you don't have to remember all this. It's just uh, to give you an idea of how this works. Uh, Mozilla has uh, uh, an open framework for badges. It's called the Mozilla Backpack, which uh, allows you to create an account. And you can see here, I created my own account with my name, my university. And uh, this account is free, and it allows you to upload um, your badges and keep your badges in one single place. So then if you have a professional uh, development page or if you have a page where you list all the professional development uh, opportunities that you have uh, taken advantage of, you, you can link to this page and people can go and see. And it's a lot richer than just a list because people are going to be able to see not just what you did, but everything that describes the whole experience. So it's a really uh, powerful way to document your professional development. So once you select, I'm sorry, I should have said, when you click on upload a badge there, once you click there, you're going to go to a page like this that says choose a file and upload the file. And that's basically it. Uh, that's all you need to do. And that's going to give you the access to the, um, uh, the, 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 um, Let's say it's going to finish a process of, 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 of displaying the badge to the world. Now, looking ahead, um, this uh, online institute was, uh, as we mentioned before, a pre-requirement for the 2015 Summer Institute that is going to take place here in Honolulu. And the big plan here is to uh, address project-based language learning from many different perspectives. So every year we're going to be building on what we learned from the previous year. And after uh, 2015 and 2016, we're going to have a summer institute that focuses more on what Stephen talked about, uh, Cultura and um, PBLL. And for that institute, we're going to have Sabine Levitt from the MIT and Stephen leading it. Then 2017, we're going to focus on assessment in PBLL, LL, there's one more L. Uh, and Tom Hudson is going to be the leader of that institute. And finally, in 2018, we're going to focus on project-based language learning in professional development. Um, and for that one, Cherise is going to come back, and then Marta Gonzalez and myself are going to be the leaders of that institute. So just to uh, wrap this up, the whole idea here is not to say uh, this is what PBALL is and just push it to the profession, but rather to have folks like you who care about the topic help define it. And if you remember when... Uh, Russ talked about uh, from PBLL to from PBL to PBLL. He mentioned that there is this uh, opportunity for you to get involved and to tell us what you think uh, PBL means in the context of language learning. And I'm very thankful to a couple of folks. Uh, Betsy was one of them. And sorry, Betsy, I didn't ask you for permission to show this, but. Um, you're one of the people, you know that this is public, so <laughs> you're one of the people who already gave us some feedback, and we we very much appreciate this because this is what we want to do. We want to create a plan for PBLL for everyone where people like you who know about teaching and learning and who know about the the, the opportunities and the, the um, constraints uh, have a, a voice in this uh, process. And um, finally, I would like to uh, thank all those folks um, that, oops, sorry about that, that helped make this, um, uh, sorry, I kind of missed the last one. <laughs> uh, the amazing group of folks that um, helped us throughout this journey. And um, just as a reminder, we are going to have uh, the Summer Institute, oh, I guess I'm not, uh, there is a delay in my computer. Sorry about that. But it looks so nice because it's all the pictures of everybody here. And this is this is basically the, the group of people that uh, created this um, institute. So we have a few minutes uh, for questions, and we wanted to open this up uh, a little bit as a panel. I think Liliana is still online. 
Uh, so she's also uh, welcome to answer any other questions that might have popped up in the last couple of minutes. Okay, um, some questions already. Um, so for worksheets, uh, is it okay to just describe it briefly? For example, worksheets for students to list websites they have found on the topic of tips for the Chinese students studying in other countries. Yes. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, uh, it was a clarification. Uh, it says, so you mean giving feedback or receiving feedback as one of the five requirements? It, it is. The, the original requirement was to participate in the discussion. If you did that, you fulfill the requirement. If you haven't been able to do that or if you're taking the self-paced version and you prefer to do something more interactive, uh, you can request feedback and that will be uh, considered as fulfilling that requirement. The next question is, um, are we required to upload our badge or is it optional? Oh, the uploading the uploading of the badge is optional. Um, it's encouraged if you want to show it. Uh, if you have a professional development page, or uh, uh, you know, you have a page that where you show your uh, professional development somewhere, then that would be a great way to display the badge. But you don't have to um, upload it. And the Mozilla account that I showed you that you can open it up for free, that's uh, entirely uh, up to you. You don't have to do it. Okay. Um, just a reminder, the poll is up, so please uh, participate in that if you could. Uh, the next question is, what is the best way for us to contact each other? All right. So in the volunteer spot, um, you, if you are in a group, you have, or you should have, the links to everybody's um, within the group, everybody's um, blueprint. Uh, it's we don't uh, want to manage this process. We just want you to connect with these folks there. So volunteer spot is a good way. Uh, if 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 you go there, you can put a message there. And you can tell people, I would like to work with you, for example, uh, or would you be able to give me feedback on it? We try to make it uh, uh, groups of up to five people so that it's more manageable. Uh, but, of course, it's entirely up to you. If, if you want to make use of that group, uh, we will recommend that you do. Um, that will be the way to connect uh, with other folks there. We are aware that there is an issue with volunteer spot, which is when you try to open – somebody's uh, um, Google Doc, which has the project blueprint, uh, if you don't use a shortcut like Command-C to copy, uh, it closes. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to make a document available uh, that is going to be um, on the main interface where you go to uh, log on. You know, when you, when you come here to uh, where the modules are listed, you're going to see a button there that has the groups next to where it says my groups. And that way, if you're having issues with volunteer spot, um, you're going to be able to simply scroll down to your group in that document and click on the links for the uh, other folks' uh, blueprints. Next question. Um, how, would we, uh, how would we know if the list of peers are from the Asynchronous or Synchronous Institute? Would that matter for getting feedback? It does not matter. It doesn't matter. Um, we we are uh, putting everybody in the same system, so it's, uh, it doesn't really matter. Next question. Uh, my edits of the blueprint show shows as track changes in Google Docs. Should I keep it on or turn off track changes? No, you should turn it off. Yeah, you don't want to track changes. Next question. Do we have to carry out the project in a real class? 
That's a really good question. And uh, you don't have to for the badge, uh, but um, we uh, that's, that's our plan for the Summer Institute uh, to get folks up to speed to actually try that in a real class. If you do try it in a real class, we would love to, to keep connected with you and keep learning about what you're doing. Um, the uh, one way that you could do that is um, through our email. You can tell Jim, uh, nflrc at hawaii.edu, that you're working on something or that you did something. And uh, we can see if we can showcase your project somehow. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that one of the plans uh, for the NFLRC is to create a repository of model projects uh, that people are going to be able to adapt to their own classrooms. So we want to create a repository of very, very good projects, and uh, we hope that uh, the, the people who participate in the summer institutes are going to be uh, the people developing those and trying those. Um, so by all means, you know, keep keep connected uh, because we uh, we will be very interested in knowing how you are progressing and what you're doing with PBLL. What is the deadline to finish everything for getting the badge? There are two deadlines. Uh, the first deadline is March 15. Um, if you are interested in participating in the Summer Institute, that's coming up soon in two weeks. Um, so by March 15, you have to turn in um, the, the project. Uh, there is a little bit more time for those of you who are not uh, planning on attending the Summer Institute. And I think, uh, I don't have it right here, but I think it's uh, up to the end of April that you can actually uh, uh, obtain a badge. Next question. How does the Summer Institute extend this online portion? That's a really good question. So this, this portion is fundamentals of project-based language learning. And quite frankly, every one of the lessons that you witnessed and that you participated in can be turned into a book. <laughs> so uh, we try to unpack PBLL as much as possible and give, give people an overview of PBLL. But um, the, the Summer Institute is going to go deeper uh, into designing the projects and into getting feedback face-to-face -face with folks and into getting feedback uh, at, at a higher, uh, let's say, level. Um, so the, the difference is that this is, uh, let's say, uh, 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 like an introduction to project-based language learning. Uh, the Summer Institute is going to give you more. Um, you're going to be more, more like intermediate at the end of it. Uh, Stephen here. I would like to add that the, in the Summer Institute, you can take the project that you have started the blueprint for here and flesh it out, make it fuller, make more plans, make, you know, flesh out your rubrics and your worksheets, your activity ideas, and break it down into a more fine grained. On the other hand, you could start over. Uh, <laughs> if you felt like you wanted to trash your blueprint, you could start a new one. Okay, the next question uh, I think is related to the level of detail in the, in the project blueprint, if I'm understanding this correctly. It says, should the project be so detailed or might be just the main idea? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so if, if you follow the guiding questions in the uh, blueprint, and uh, you make sure that you are addressing uh, those points, I think you should be okay. Okay, next question. <laughs> Can the first deadline be extended? The first deadline meaning the 15th? Uh, that's, uh, we, we would have to see, uh, but um, it's, it's going to be difficult because we need to uh, make decisions as to um, it's it's very competitive. So um, I would try to get things in by March 15. Uh, I'd also like to just make a point too that um, the the March 15 deadline is particularly important if you're planning to apply for the summer institute. If you just want to complete the um, online institute and just get 
the badge. I mean, March 15th isn't the deadline for that. You have much more time. It's just that deadline is particularly for those applying for the Summer Institute. Okay, um, another question. Are there any other institutes or universities that are also focusing on PBLL? Not that we know of. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> we're, um, the, there might be... Well, the Buck Institute for Education is doing a lot of work, and uh, uh, especially K-12, uh, and we are trying to address PBLL and higher ed um, and in the less commonly taught languages. But um, there is not much, and if you take a look at what has been produced uh, in terms of PBLL, you will see that the vast majority is for Spanish and, and for the more commonly taught languages. Uh, there are very few um, projects in the less commonly taught languages. I know one at um, Keene University by uh, Janice Jensen. She was coordinating a Hindi project over there that was amazing. The students were actually creating a radio show in New York, I think, right? Um, so if uh, w w I think we have links to that project somewhere. Uh, but uh, that, that's uh, one of the few places where we know that in higher education has been implemented. But uh, for the most part, um, we don't know um, of other colleagues that are working in this area. Okay, final question. Um, I think you might have addressed this already. Uh, will we get feedback from the NFLRC team or just my volunteer group? The feedback comes... Uh, from the volunteer group, if uh, we notice something that uh, needs to be addressed for the project to actually uh, uh, get, um, you know, for you to get a badge, then we, we can intervene and take a look. Uh, but if the badge requirements are um, uh, complied with, then it's uh, it, it, we don't need to, um, uh, you know, you shouldn't expect us to, to, to give you uh, feedback. If, there's for any reason you have questions. I think it would be totally fine if uh, you put the, the questions in the discussions, um, so that way we know uh, that, that you have questions. But other than that, I think uh, uh, it's, it's too many people probably to <laughs> to try to give individual feedback. Um, sorry, one final question. Um, it says if a group member doesn't return uh, feedback. Uh, by March 15th, um, can I turn my blueprint in? If you're having issues re uh, getting the feedback, um, I think, as we said before, um, to get the badge, the requirement is really to participate in the discussion. So uh, the, the feedback, not having feedback is not going to prevent you from getting the badge. Uh, so to get the badge, you have to do either of two things, either participate in a discussion or get feedback. All right, everybody. Uh, it looks like we're at our end point for time. Thank you all very much for participating, and we look forward to seeing some awesome project blueprint ideas. And uh, we'll be getting material up as soon as we can uh, to follow so that you'll be able to make your deadline. Thank you and aloha.